All right, everybody. Good to see you all this morning. Kiddos, we've got something for you. So kids, K through 5 over here on this side. Kiddos, that, yeah, big kids too. K through, old people right over here on this side. And uh, and uh, our preschoolers, come on over this side. See Miss Sarah over here. Miss Heather and Mr. Joel over here on this side. Come get you some, come grab your bag. So parents, send them K through 5 over this way. And preschoolers prior to K over on this side over here. Everybody, as we're going through worship, I uh, I just want to I want to compliment you today. As these kiddos are getting their bags, I want to compliment you uh, because it's fun to see the aunts and uncles of Legacy Church caring for other people's kids. And uh, I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for embracing cross generational worship. Some of these Sundays can be challenges for us. And uh, those of you that grew up where church is supposed to be, where you sit still and be quiet, uh, these kinds of Sundays can be a challenge. And so thank you for being flexible. Thank you for your embrace of what it means to set an example for the kiddos as they are preparing to enter into this service, even from birth uh, all the way until today. And so, uh, and so they're, they're, they're planning on being an adult someday and getting to care for their kids. So thanks for setting an example for them. And thanks for worshiping through all of the all of the organized chaos that we have in the room. And so sure grateful for each of you. May I pray and then we'll get cranking. Father, we thank you so much for this time. And I thank you for the, the generations that are that are reflected here today on this Father's Day. Lord, we thank you that no matter what our situation and our circumstance holds today, we thank you for being the perfect father. We thank you for setting the example and we thank you for the, the declaration that you give to us that says there's nothing we're ever going to do that's going to make you love us any less. Thank you for that. Father, I pray that we bask in your presence and we enjoy time together today with you through the challenge of the message, through the challenge of your word, through the comfort and care of your truth. And Father, we pray that it be something that spurs us on to be more and more like you, to pass on the love that you give to us to all the world around. Thank you, Lord, for being our hope. Thank you for being our future. And Lord, for the joy that is set before us. Thank you that we can endure whatever this world tends to throw our way. We love you and we thank you so much for today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I know today is one of those days that, that comes with all kinds of emotions. It's Father's Day. Today, for some of you, this is the first Sunday, the first Father's Day since your father has passed this last year. And it makes for a very challenging day for you. We want you to know we're with you. Some of you, as you sit here today, you remember a dad, and today is anything but a celebration for the way that he parented you growing up. For that, we mourn alongside you today as you struggle through today. Thank you for trusting us to be here today. For some of you, as you sit here today, you're thinking of all of the amazing memories you shared with your father as you went fishing and as you, as you, uh, as you, as they, they were uh, participating alongside you in your extracurricular activities and they were present in your life. And today you are honoring them at an all-time high. And there are many of you today, as you sit across the room, and you you find yourself today as a father. And you're thinking of the challenges that you've had as a dad, the ways that you've had victory, and the ways that, that you, you've experienced challenge. We want you to know, no matter where you are today, we're with you. We love you, we're thankful for you, and we're grateful that we get to spend today with you. The good news for everybody across the room, no matter what your story is, today we worship the Heavenly Father that is the perfect Father. We all share that perfect father together who loves you who cares for you who says to each and every one of you says to each and every one of us there is nothing that you will ever do that will make him love you any less guys that's hopeful and that's good news and i'm grateful that we get to share that together today we get to have that experience today regardless of whatever our circumstances is we can find joy in that we can find really good news in that I know today is also a day that we find ourselves, uh, maybe perhaps in this season of life, anybody experience this where it's summertime, but yet somehow, some way, your schedule is even more busy now than it was during the school year? Anybody experience that? How in the world is that possible? You know what I mean? The schedule has changed and you're thinking, it's going to be a reprieve, we're going to enjoy time this summer, and the next thing you know, 
you're busier now than you had were a month ago. Anybody stressed out today? You got stressed, the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you're wondering how in the world you're going to get everything accomplished you need to get accomplished? Anybody f uh, finding yourself where finances are weighing down on you to where you're wondering if you're going to have enough money for the month, this month? Man, we live in a world that's full of pressure, don't we? We're full, we live in a world that is full of anxiety and fear and all of those kinds of things. We live in a culture that pushes us to our limit every single day and some days pushes us beyond our limit. To where we find ourselves going, man, how in the world can I get accomplished everything I need to get accomplished? We find ourselves living life constantly teetering on a breaking, at a breaking point. Wondering what is the thing that's going to push us over to where we just lose our ever-loving mind, right? To where we just, we just, it just all falls down and we're not sure what we're going to do to recover. You guys, have you ever experienced Murphy's Law? You know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. You know, there's another part of Murphy's Law that would, that would speak to our reality and say that our stuff will always mysteriously expand to fill the space allotted for it. Whether it's the 84,000 and some change seconds we get to spend every day, whether it's our bank account, whether it's our house, anybody's house automatically full of just stuff. It just, it's amazing, isn't it? Where you're like, where did all this come from? It's crazy how the stuff that we have, the time that we share, and all these things in life, they just tend to expand. And it just fills whatever space is available. Even to the point where we find ourselves, for me to make room for anything else seems impossible. For me to make room for time for the Lord, for me to make room for time for each of my children, for me to make time for my spouse, for me to make time for my friends, for me to make time for fill in the blank. It seems impossible, doesn't it? To make space for more finances, to be more generous, doesn't that seem impossible? To make this space and to have this uncommon room that we're going to talk about, it just seems impossible. Well, in the words of the astronauts, we might say, Houston, we got a problem, right? And in the words of the uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, admittance is the first step. We've got to kind of look at ourselves and admit that we've got a problem in order for there to be a change that is made. Now, here's the, here's the harsh reality as we sit here in June of 2017. In January of this year, we gave ourselves a goal. One of our three goals this year was to simplify life. Oh, dear. To discover what we're going to stop doing this year in order to refresh and renew passion for what matters most. We articulated it this way. This year, we want this year to be less reactive and more proactive. We want to experience less rush this year and more hush. How you doing? Mission accomplished, right? You got this thing whipped. No problem. It's, here, it's, it's month six and you're like, what am I going to do with the rest of my year now? No, man. If your life has played out a lot like my life is, I've made a concerted effort to pray to this end, to think through this end, and to work my tail off to get here. I still got a tail, though. It's growing. I'm trying to not let it. You'll get it eventually. Um, here's, here's how this has played out in my life. My life this year, I've discovered that in order to figure out what I'm going to stop doing, it actually takes more work to actually stop doing what I'm doing so that I can have peace on the other side. Have you discovered that? How the responsibilities that you share, you've got to kind of double up. You've got to teach somebody to do what you're doing so that you can turn loose from it, so that you can lay your head down at night knowing whatever responsibility was yours is now well covered. You can let go of it and feel good about the state you left it in. It's work, isn't it? To try to figure out and finish strong with your commitments to make sure that you're not letting people down in the process. You've got to make sure that you multiply those efforts out into other people. This is a lot of work. I hope that you're well on your way of getting there. But I know this, this forethought, the scheduling, creating margin financially, man, it's almost like we need a supernatural strength in order to solve this crisis. Huh? It's almost like we need something bigger than us. 
Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about uncommon room. We're going to talk about creating space for God to work and to really take a good check of our, of our lives so far and to then look at the remainder of this year and say, i got six months left to see how I can do even better at creating this space. We're going to discover over the next little bit that everybody shares the same problems. All right, everybody shares the same issue that you're dealing with. When you think of your schedule and your demands, and you think of that, you're not alone in that. That's the good news. We can all share that. We can all look at that and go, okay, good. At least I'm not by myself in this. That's a good thing. A very good thing. We're confronted all together with the truth that what we create space for is what really matters to us. And so as we look at our schedules and we look at our demands and we look at everything, we can look and see whatever it is that we choose to make time for, that declares what really matters to us. And so when you think about your life, this moment right now is not one of those moments for you to feel guilty or for you to feel condemnation because that's not why Christ came. He came in order to set us free. He came to say, it's going to be okay. And so today, hear that. Hear that it's going to be okay. And the reason that, I, that he can say that is this is not a common or this is not a problem that's only existed in your lifetime. This is not just a 21st century problem. Even though we may feel like we run a faster pace today, even though we may feel like technology is at the is, is creating a, a pace that is unsustainable for us, the reality is that this problem that we're dealing with of the schedule being too full and trying to find time for God to fit into our schedule, it's not something that has just now occurred. In fact, back in 600 BC, there was a people. There were a people that were experiencing the same thing. They were trying to figure out what to do because they were living a pace that seemed unsustainable. They were trying to figure out how to fit everything in they needed to fit in to make the space for God to be existing in their life, for them to, to worship the, the God that they love. And it's a pressure that was strong. They desired to follow their God, yet they were struggling finding the time to fit him in. And then there was a prophet that was charged with walking this special people, walking this, these people through the crisis. He got the privilege of warning them of, of the impending danger that was coming if they continued at the pace in which they were living. And then from there, once that danger occurred, his job then was to see them through to the other side, providing hope for what is to come and the Savior that was to come on this earth. His name is Isaiah, and these are his words. Isaiah 58, 3-5. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast you find your desire and drive hard all of your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. And he asks the question, is a fast like this a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for borrowing one's, or is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast even acceptable, an acceptable day to the Lord? You see, the people of God had done what so many people on this planet do today. With all the pressures and demands of their time, rather than creating space for God to work, they made their space for God a part of their schedule rather than the driver of it. They began going to church rather than being the church. They began trying to fit God in as a part of their social schedule rather than the driver of the social schedule. They tried to figure out how in the course of all of the day's demands and the week's demands and the month's demands, they could fit God in rather than giving God the reins to all of those demands to do what He desires to do or not to do with them. Rather than centering everything on the ways of the Lord, they had turned fasting and prayer into a ritual activity rather than the relationship building worship is intended to be. They turned relationship into religion. 
and a list of do's and don'ts. And so rather than creating the space to remind them throughout their busy day to talk to their Heavenly Father, they simply turn the fast into another duty, into another thing to do. Their relationship with God had become something they had to do rather than something they got to do. And here's the result of that. Anytime our relationship with God becomes something we have to do instead of something we get to do, it produces an edgy, irritable community. Every single time. Because there's resentment. There's frustration. There's guilt. There's shame. There's condemnation. There's all of those things that the enemy loves to do to the people of God. And none of which is what God ever intended for His people to experience through the life that He had place before them to live. This happens all the time. When our relationship with God becomes something we have to do instead of something we get to do, it produces an edgy, irritable community. Maybe you've experienced that around here every now and then. Perhaps maybe you've experienced that in previous churches that you've worshipped together with. That it was more about the to-do list and making Sundays happen than it was about a relationship with God the Father. We want to fight hard against this. The truth is, is that this early church needed Jesus, didn't they? This early church needed a relationship with God the Father. They were struggling in how to reach out to Him. And we find ourselves today no less in need of a Savior. The difference is, we have Jesus. We have the connector between us and God the Father that is available to save us. We need Jesus. Now the good news is, is that when Jesus walked this earth and He died on the cross for you and me, He knew that we were going to turn what God intended for good in our lives into a list of do's and don'ts. He knew it was going to happen. He knew that the world was going to come crashing down and the weight of the world and the all-powerful American, the all uh, powerful American dollar was going to take control. He knew that we were going to live this life that we're currently living. And that's why he prayed a very specific prayer to his heavenly father on behalf of the followers at that time in the first century that then still reflect in us today. Jesus prayed, he said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And he says this word, sanctify them, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. You see, Jesus knew that in this world we were going to have trouble. He knew it was going to be hard. He knew that things were going to weigh down. And he knew that we would fill every waking moment up with something. He knew that we were going to do that. He knew, he knew that consequently we would perpetually be dissatisfied with our reality and we would then be in pursuit of freedom from it. He knew that was going to happen. He knew that we would then only make the cycle even more vicious with the added pressure of working harder in order to make enough money to be able to afford the freedom that we are looking for. Especially when the comparison trap of who's going on what vacation begins to play out. Who's getting the time that I wish I had? Who's making this? He knew that was going to happen. But Jesus did not ask God to spare us from this challenge. Jesus did something far more powerful. He didn't, he didn't ask us to not have to go through. He didn't ask God for us to not have to go through the challenge. He simply turned to the Heavenly Father and asked to separate us. He asked to sanctify us. He asked to make us holy. He asked God to save us from the norms of our world. He didn't ask us to not have to go through them. He simply asked us, he asked God to save us from these norms. He asked God to show us the truth so that we are changed by the working of his word in our lives. He asked so that we would be separated from evil and tethered forever and ever to God the Father, proclaiming Jesus as our Savior. So here's what he's asking. Jesus asked and prayed for God. He asked God, for us to be able to tell the story of the gospel through our lives. You see, this crisis that we're in, it's not new. But something that's new in our day today is that we get the privilege of proclaiming Jesus 
as Savior. We get the privilege of saying, my life is chaos. My life is, well, I wish you I could call it organized chaos, but it's just flat out chaos. And I need Jesus. And so we get to tell a very different story than the world that's looking on to the church is telling. Because while our life may be chaos, we have hope. And we're not, we don't have to run this race that is a perpetual grind. We don't have to. Jesus can genuinely save us from this. So Jesus prayed for us to tell the story of the gospel through our lives. And he prayed for us to have uncommon responses to very common situations. He prayed for us to have uncommon responses to very common situations. To not fall into the same trap of bigger, better, faster. He asked for us to simplify life. He asked for God to help us to simplify life. Because Jesus knew. He knew. If our lives look no different than the onlooking world, how will they ever see their need for Jesus? If your life looks exactly like your friend in the cube next to you who does not know Christ, why in the world would they want your Jesus. Why would they see their need for your Jesus? Your Jesus is just a crutch. We have a gospel message to tell through our lives. Our lives must look different. And it's time to create some space for God to work. But we all know the truth, don't we? That creating space for God to work means that we have to decide. We have to decide what goes and we have to decide what stays. And it all starts with creating time throughout the day. We've got to find time to communicate with our Heavenly Father. And so we look back to our friends in 600 B.C. at a practice of spiritual discipline in order to spend time with our Heavenly Father in which they jacked up. We know we have a tendency to do the same thing, but one of the ways that we can make time for God is to allow Him to work through spiritual fasting. Is to allow Him to, to, to be the priority in our day. And so therefore we go without something. And every time we want that something, we find ourselves in the presence of our Heavenly Father. You see, fasting requires us to separate from the rat race in order to discover the truth. And that's what we need, don't we? We need something that we have to insert that will help us to separate to be saved from the rat race in order to discover the truth. We have to find ourselves asking the question, should it stay or should it go? We have to find ourselves asking this question, should we say yes or should we say no? Now, throughout scripture, fasting refers to the abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. So we go without this food and every time we get hungry, we spend time in the presence of our Heavenly Father in order to seek the truth and to be set apart by it. Now, there's three different kinds of fasting. For some of you, this is a reminder. For some of you, this may be a first for you. And as we talk about fasting, it's important for us to grasp what we're doing. This is not just something to add to your schedule. This is something to drive a relationship with our Heavenly Father. It's important. And so in Scripture, this normal means of fasting involves abstaining from all food, solid or liquid, but not from water. The example is when Jesus spent 40 days with His Heavenly Father, right? We're told that He ate nothing and that towards the end of the fast, He was hungry. And so that gives us the example that He was abstaining from food, but not from water. This is what's called the whole fast. There's also room for something that's called the partial fast, which we find in the book of Daniel. And so we see Daniel who, who, who departed from his normal fasting practices for a fast that was a three-week period in which he declared, I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. And so this is called the partial fast. This would be something like we see during the season of Lent where you give up chocolate, or you give up meat, or you give up something that you really enjoy partaking of in order to spur you on to spending time in prayer. Now there's also a third type of fast, which is called the absolute fast. 
And now this one here is abstaining from both food and also water for a period of time. Now something you have to understand about the absolute fast is this is a really serious one here. And this one is only to be reserved as a desperate measure in order to meet a dire emergency. You can understand why. If you're going without food and water, it can become a health problem very quickly. So you got to be very careful about this. But here would be an example of when the absolute fast would be one that was applied. It's kind of like when Esther learned that all of the people of God, all of the Jews were going to be executed and she was going to need to speak before the king on their behalf. She found herself reaching out to Mordecai and she said, Go and gather all the Jews and hold a fast on my behalf. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. And I and my maids will also fast as you do. See, this is for dire emergency moments only. So you have the whole fast, you have the partial fast, and you have the absolute fast. In each of these instances, though, here's how the fast is to play out. When the pains of hunger show up, or when the pains of desire show up for whatever it is that you're going without, then that's your cue to pray for whatever it is you're fasting for. And so perhaps maybe this week it's time to fast and say, Lord, I need my life to be simplified because I have no margin right now for error. If the enemy inserts something right now, I have no ability to move and to shake. It just becomes that much more crushing on my life. And so maybe it's time to fast and give God your schedule. And fast and pray over your finances. And fast and pray over uh, the choices that you make day in and day out for how you're going to go about your day. And so what's happening here is, in the midst of your everyday life, we are creating space in order for God to work. This is a discipline that we do in order to create this space. And we trust the Spirit of God to drive when we fast. We trust the Spirit of God to drive why we fast. And we trust the Spirit of God to reveal the truth. To reveal His truth through the fast. And out of that, we can then begin to determine what are those really good things that we have a part of our everyday life that we need to say no to so that we say yes to the very best thing. Because my guess is there's nobody in this room that's wanting to fill your life with a bunch of stuff that doesn't mean anything. You're probably guilty of saying yes too many times to things that are actually good things. But it's actually preventing you from saying yes to the best things. And so we've got to figure this out. We need God the Father to help us out. But when we trust the Spirit of God to drive the fast. When we trust the Spirit of God, when we, we make that room, we create that space for God to work, we can, we can be confident of this. And this is what Isaiah helped the early church understand. What Isaiah helped the people of God understand in verse 11. He tells us this. He says, when we create space for God to work, the, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in, a, in scorched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a, wa like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Man, doesn't that sound nice? My guess is this may not describe how you would describe life. And so we've got to give God our schedule. We've got to give Him control of these things. Guys, when we create space for God to work, Isaiah is helping us understand that we're then able to operate out of God's plenty rather than out of our deficiency. And my guess is, is that there's many of you that are sitting in this room today that feel like you're operating out of your deficiency rather than out of God's plenty. And so we've got to give God this. We've got to give this to Him. And then we can find hope in our Savior, right? We find hope in Jesus. As, as he was praying for us in John chapter 17, he said, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Now here's what these words mean. It doesn't just simply mean that, okay, here's more tasks for you to do to be a good Christian. What this means is that Jesus has tethered himself to you and me. If you've called on the name of Jesus as your Savior, he's tethered himself to you. And that the work that he began, he has entrusted us to continue. Now, before you start thinking, okay, yeah, that's more things for me to do, here's the thing you have to be reminded of. Just as the Father sent Jesus with authority, He gives us the same authority. Just as Jesus had come with a message of God's love and forgiveness, we are able to fight the edgy, irritable community 
with the message of God's love and forgiveness. And just as Jesus had come into danger, we will encounter those same problems. But, as, she, as the Father sent Jesus to the victory of the resurrection, we also can expect the same. So the truth is that no matter what this world throws your way, when we create space for God to work, He will always bring us through to the other side. The promise is He is with us to the very end of the age. When we make uncommon room in our lives, and when we create space for God to work, the impossible becomes possible. Those things that are so weighty on you right now can become less weighty. It doesn't mean that the pressures are different. It just means that our response to the pressures become different. We find ourselves with a resolution. We find ourselves with a strength that is new. It's refreshing because we've learned that we are not doing this on our own. And we can do things that we never thought we were able to do. We can determine what stays and what goes. We can determine that we are actually not the only ones that can do the things that we're currently doing. Other people actually can. We don't have to think so highly of ourselves in that we think, I'm the only one. Because the truth is, we're not, are we? Sometimes we've got to create space for God to work by not doing some of the things that we're doing so that somebody else can do the thing that God has for them to do. We're just occupying their space. And He desires to do far more through them than He does us. We can trust God with the things we think that nobody else can do but us. We can know that God is already aware of way more in our lives than we can see. And here's the cool thing that happens. As we begin to let go, as we begin to give over those things to our Heavenly Father. We let those strings go that we're hanging on to. All of the things that, that we see as our responsibility. We begin to let go of some of the good things so that we hang on to the ones that are best, right? We discover that what ends up happening is, and what was happening in our lives is that those strings that we were hanging on to that we felt like we just had to do, that God longed for us to turn loose from, we can discover that those strings were actually holding us back from experiencing and producing far more than we are today. See, God has much bigger plans for us. We've just, we've got to trust Him with Him. And there's a commentator who's way smarter than I am who can paint a picture for us of what this looks like. We'll begin to turn these things loose. loose. He says, the glorious dawn will then issue an even more glorious midday. What that means is, what we see coming and how beautiful it is that that heaven is, as we long for heaven and we turn loose of the things that are not as important, we turn loose of the things that God says it's okay to let go, and we hang on to the things that are the most important, we can see that today becomes better. And in, in this light, life that is fully provided for and strong, it's always refreshed and ever refreshing to others. It can flourish under God's blessing. See, this is the plan that God has for you and me. Sometimes we got to get out of the way in order for it to happen. And so this week, in the middle of the hustle and bustle of your life, in the middle of the rush of life, may you think, may you think on simplifying life. See, this week we're just admitting we have a problem. This week we're just simply placing it before God. This week we're simply making room for God to begin to expose those things that we're struggling with. And in the weeks to come, we're going to talk about dealing with them. And so this week, may you make space for God to work. May you think less, or excuse me, may you think less rush and may you think more hush. May you make room through fasting. And may you make room through fasting and seeking the truth of really what matters most in your day. And may you supernaturally be set free from the pressures of the schedule. May you supernaturally have uncommon responses to very common circumstances. And may you operate out of God's plenty rather than out of your deficiency. In other words, may you and me this week, as we create space for God, may we flourish under God's blessing 
of this thing called unkind room. Father, we're sure grateful for you. And we know that you've made our path straight. We know that you already see what we need to turn loose of. We know that there are going to be some things in the coming weeks that it's going to be hard to say no to. But Lord, I pray that we trust you with it all. Lord, I pray that we see you for who you are and that we genuinely can cast our burdens on you because you care for us. Lord, may we know that, that your desire in our lives is for us to tether ourselves to you so that you can help us see what matters most. And then, Lord, out of that, help us to find some knowledge. Help us to begin to see the things. But, Lord, help us this week to simply identify. Help us identify those things and raise them to the top of the list so that we know what we need to deal with. Father, will you let us see it? And, Father, will you let us trust you? Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.